Hello, my name is Professor Matthew Schmidt and welcome to Genetics. In this session we're going to be discussing recombinant DNA as we have been, but we're going to be focusing on its applications, that is the real biotechnological things that we can do uh, with this type of technology. Now there's a certain amount of overlap because even within the previous sessions if you've been watching in order, we say, okay, you know, you can use restriction enzymes to clone a gene. That's an application. But now we're looking a little bit more broadly and saying, great, you can clone a gene. What do you do with that? Or, you know, what are the more, I guess, everyday, I don't know if it's everyday, but everyday use, practical type of things that we can extract using these basic technologies. So let's take a look. And obviously, this is not going to be an exhaustive list. We're going to focus on the ones that are the most common and the most used. So here we just have a list, applications of recombinant DNA technology. Um, firstly, identifying and isolating human. Now, I wrote disease genes here, but think about this. If you've been following along, one of the big examples we used was identifying and isolating the human insulin gene, right? And then we already showed how, you know, basically we showed how you can use that to actually make human insulin, which technically should be in this section, but we were using it as an example. So it doesn't have to be a disease gene. It's just that obviously genetic diseases, we certainly want to know what gene is responsible. We want to be able to know what it does and to characterize it, etc. So it's not limited to that, but certainly disease genes are widely studied. And a lot of times, as we're going to see, we learn about the normal function of genes by looking at the disease gene. We say, this person has this problem. Oh, look, this gene is altered. What must the normal, if you will, version of that gene do? Once we have that information, uh, it's a little controversial to some people, but we can test for genetic diseases. I wrote prenatally here. Um, sometimes that's desirable, sometimes later in life it's desirable. A big one that I know you've heard about has to do with so-called DNA fingerprinting, which can be used for a variety of things, but the most common are paternity testing and forensic analysis of uh, biological material. Commercial products, as we just mentioned, so making recombinant sub protein substances using bacteria, Human insulin is a great example. Human growth hormone is a protein, so you can make that as well. So a lot of things that are, uh, I should say, some things that are uh, traditionally, I mean in the past, you know insulin from different animals was used. Now we can make it easily. HDGH could be extracted from humans, but now we can make it in unlimited quantities. Gene therapy is something that we really hope is going to be a major thing. I'm not trying to minimize it, but the actual successes with it have been a little bit spotty. But this is the idea of uh, saying, wow, you have a genetic problem. Maybe we can do something to fix it or variants of that. Genetic engineering, I know you've heard about. That's another sort of broad term. I mean, in one sense, engineering means any manipulation of genes. But in this sense, I'm talking about transgenics, which means taking a gene of interest, we've done something like this before, um, from one species and putting it into another species or changing a gene that's in another species. So those are very interesting things. And cloning of organisms, we've talked about cloning of genes, but of course you've all heard most of it's science fiction about taking uh, oneself and making a clone of it for various purposes. I mean, if I could do it, obviously the world would be a much better place with a bunch of me's running around. Just kidding. But it is, uh, a lot of these things have ethical components to it, which we can't cover in great detail. Bioethicists have to do that. Maybe that's a field you might be interested in. But certainly it would be controversial if we had the capability to clone a human being, depending what the idea was we were going to use that individual for. So let's take a little bit more uh, detailed look at each of these. So the identification and isolation of human genes uh, focus on disease genes. Now we already know that recombinant DNA techniques in general will allow us to uh, 
map a particular area of interest on the DNA. But mapping means a couple of different things. So think of a human, let's say it was a human disease. You would want to know a variety of things about the gene. If you could identify the gene, where, what chromosome is it on, for example. And then you'd want a more fine scale map, maybe like a restriction map showing where this gene lies in relation to the other either genes or other parts of the chromosome because as we'll talk about in a different lecture um, most of the genetic material is not necessarily genes and ultimately if you're able to pinpoint exactly where it was using techniques we've discussed you can do a DNA sequence now you could sequence the mutant in other words someone who was suffering with the genetic disease compare it with the wild type allele meaning that which is derived from someone who's healthy, who doesn't have the disease, and you can see what's the difference between them. Um, it wasn't done this way, but we've discussed a, a while back how hemoglobin from someone who had sickle cell anemia is not all that different from normal hemoglobin, but we know exactly where it is different, and that explains the difference in the protein and, and the disease. So a lot of times it's really not, sometimes it is, but it's not always that obvious just from looking at the physical manifestations or the symptoms of a genetic disease exactly what type of gene is going on or going wrong. Cystic fibrosis is a perfect example of that where there's a problem with um, epithelial function, mucus overproduction, etc. And it turns out that it's an ion transporter that's the gene that's being compromised. So interestingly, if you can do this, now I said this allows prediction of the sequence of the wild type protein. So in other words, you, you have to maybe think about this for a minute, but using techniques we've discussed, you can isolate a gene and not even have any idea, assuming that it makes a protein, which it probably does, what that protein is or what it does. Once you know the gene and the wild type sequence of it, you can predict just from the sequence of the codons, the amino acid sequence of the wild type protein, right? And then you can, there's a database that we're building up. You could say, okay, well, this protein sort of resembles, just for example, another one we know is a transmembrane protein. Then you can narrow it down. So it can give a clue to what the, what type of a protein this is, what it probably does. And then you can try and get to the bottom of what the normal function and the aberrant, the disease form function is. In other words, what's changing in this protein, just like we mentioned about hemoglobin, that's causing the disease. But remember, the reason the hemoglobin is different in someone with sickle cell anemia is because they have a mutation at the gene level, at the DNA level, right? So I'm saying this is a prerequisite to gene therapy in the sense that we'll talk about gene therapy in a minute, but the bottom line is, if you want to replace or alter the functioning of a gene, clearly you have to know what that gene is and have some idea of what it's supposed to do or what it's doing wrong or what it's not doing at all. Okay. Now, we've been successful in characterizing a lot of, uh, a lot of genetic diseases are caused by a single gene mutation, a single mutant. Uh, not all are like this. Just as an example, Down syndrome is a chromosomal uh, excess. There's an extra entire chromosome, right? So that's not one gene that's causing it. In the things that we're talking about now, it tends to be one gene that's either solely responsible for the disease or predominantly responsible. So here are two sort of popular ones. Huntington's disease. They Now, scientists who discover the gene pretty much have latitude in naming it whatever they want. They've called this gene hunting tin, which is spelled a little different. I honestly don't know why. Now, this is not something you'd have to memorize, but it's something you would want to know if you were actually working on this. So they've mapped it to the short arm of chromosome number four. And then getting much more specific, we have sequenced it and found out that we know the wild type sequence and what's different in people with hunting.